with our architect, Frank Gilmore from SRG Architects. And Frank has been working with the town on uh, renovations to this beautiful home. And uh, we got some things we're going to talk to you about today that we think are interesting uh, that will help us have a better understanding about the date of the original uh, house and uh, perhaps some news about where we're going in the future with uh, renovation. I want to start with um, talking a little bit. You spent a lot of time uh, looking at the home the different aspects of the house, the different additions. Uh, tell me, where do you place this home in architectural style? Well, it's interesting because this part of the world, at the earliest inset, um, back in the 1640s, 1650s, was a wilderness area. And the first settlers, were predominantly trappers, they were Dutch, they located on the Mohawk in an area that ultimately uh, was surrounded by a fortification stockade called the Stockade. I think everyone is familiar with that National Historic District that's uh, about 350 years old. Um, but there was a gradual change in terms of who the settlers were as the place became more populated. The English came in quite early. The, the Scottish folks around this part of uh, the, the um, upstate New York um, settled here as well. So it wasn't just the Dutch, which makes the identification of who built this thing much more intriguing. But the Dutch hallmark of how they built, how they framed, how they detailed, and most often, uh, most in particular, how they work the wood that uh, uh, becomes the structure of uh, a historic building is pretty clearly there. They have their fingerprints on it. And we were able to, to use some historic texts and some drawings that were developed by scholars of the Dutch vernacular style to compare the framing, the actual roof, roof uh, structure with other Dutch uh, prototypes, it's clearly built by Dutch craftsmen. The interesting thing about the influence of the English is by late 18th century, things like the jamless fireplace, which you've all seen probably in museums, which are these great tall uh, open fireplaces that the Dutch used to cook on and most of, the, most of the heat went up the chimney uh, just because they were not um, scientifically designed. Those things often were replaced in later years of the 18th century by English uh, versions. The original balustrades that you'd see in uh, a Dutch home of the staircase going up to the second level had turnings that were more robust, something you would see, for example, in Glenn Sanders, a perfect uh, case of a um, substantial um, and almost uh, burger-like uh, balustrade. The English balustrades, of which there's evidence on the, uh, on the, in the attic of the original 18, uh, 1790s uh, version, really are much more streamlined, much more elegant, much more simple. The spindles are either circular or square. The railing is, is often a cylindrical um, shape in cherry or a hardwood and very elegant in their simplicity as opposed to the elaborate turnings of the Dutch. So there's evidence that there was English influence in, this, in the staircase and probably English influence in subsequent fireplaces, such as this newer one uh, behind my um, left side. So the main house, what architectural style is that? And then maybe talk a little bit about the architectural styles that came later in each of the editions. In the 17th and 18th century, apprentices learned the exact same trade and solutions generation after generation. 
So what you're going to find in, in the earliest part of this house is what's called mortise and tenon construction, which is hand-hewn beams that are using adz. Uh, adz are uh, sort of a vertical, almost uh, hole-like um, uh, cutting tool that you stand over the log with, uh, and straddle it and square it up from the top. Broad axes, which are either left-handed or right-handed, that you swing from the side to take some of the scurps and, and the, the, the rough stuff that the adz provided to further trim and square up the timber. And then the mortise is is uh, a cut into a receiving piece. The tenon is the tongue that goes very tightly into that and then there's a pin that may, in many instances is put into a, a, a portable oven or over a fireplace, um, made hot and dried out and driven hard into the, the, the hole where it absorbs moisture and locks in probably forever. So this form of framing was really done without nails. Nails back in the 18th century were all hand forged. They were called rose tip nails and they were very laborious, very expensive. And so whenever possible, you framed up uh, utilizing the mortise and tenon method. So you see that in the earliest part. This is a house in the stockade. And if you, if you look closely, and we'll probably be able to pull in a closer uh, version of it later on, it has the exact same symmetry and front door uh, and window placement as the, this, this mansion. It has the two end chimneys. It has the same 12 on 12 um, gable, which means that the steepness of the gable in, in the late 18th century would, would be at a, at a uh, 45, or, or excuse me, at a 90, 45 here and a 90 at the top. The earliest Dutch houses had a pitch that was even steeper. So that really helps you date, date their antiquity. Um, but stuff like that is, is a hallmark of a historic building and some of it will tell you within decades of when this thing was built. So these are all forensic clues. If we go to the second floor at the landing of the attic staircase, which shows the original railing and spindles that would undoubtedly have also occurred here down to the main floor. You're going to see in the wall of, at the landing um, plaster has been broken away and behind the plaster is what's called riven oak lath. Riven oak lath was again the way you did your backup to receive and accept and lock in the wet plaster that, that was put on the walls. It was a thin sheet of oak cut from either a pit saw which is man on, on a scaffolding above and a man in the pit with a great big reciprocal saw that would cut up and down. Or that reciprocal saw was driven by a water wheel or, a, or in some instances if it was Dutch, a windmill. And that, those would have cut thin pieces of, of wide wood that then would be laid out on the ground with the grain running away from the carpenter he would take a hatchet and he'd whack the thing multiple times uh, in a pattern that would allow him then to take that sheet, pull it apart like an accordion, open up the, the interstices between which would then capture and lock in the plaster once it was on the wall. So these, these things were all apprenticed, they were all learned, they were all replicated for as many as two or three hundred years. Type of fireplace. The type of fireplace varied with time and varied with who built them. You know, we mentioned before the jamless fireplace uh, by the Dutch. 
that they were often replaced and the replacement situation is endemic to all older buildings. And you have to be careful what you're looking at because it may not be, for example, an original window. It may be a reproduction of an original window. It may be something that was put in in the uh, 1850s because the other windows simply wore out. Uh, so you have to be careful. But in the case of fireplaces, the English had a strong influence over the efficiency of fireplaces. So probably this could be, this is in the style of a Count Rumford fireplace. That would have happened around 1790. Now the other thing that I did in this rendering, in addition to showing the simplified um, federal, federal means 1790 porch, and showing, by the way, shingles, because in the, in the historic literature that I read, additions were typically done with, with wood cedar shingles and painted. So the, in this case, if we were to do reclad this thing with shingles and paint it, we'd probably use the same gray. Mm -hmm. We might use a lighter gray for the trim, but I'm not sure we'd want to use bright white. Um, I put an enframement around this big door and I put a new period of peering door in. Right now it's got something probably from the 1850s because it needs it. And all evidence shows with the comparable similar houses that we've found that there is a respectable enframement that formalizes the importance of the front door. So we call this Dutch, this piece Dutch, but, but because of the time that it was built, 1780s, 90s, somewhere like that, you dated it, would this be considered an example of Federalist architecture? It's Federal in period, mm -hmm. but it's, it, it really is, um, it's, an, it's an amalgam of styles. Mm -hmm. the, if, you, if you go through um, the New England, um, landscape with a lot of antique architecture that's quite venerable. You're going to see a symmetrical facade and building like this that's called Georgian. Georgian is obviously English and usually a brick, which is what this is. So this is a this is a a variant on the Georgian forms, but definitely with Dutch workmanship and Dutch Dutch uh, detailing. Uh, so it's a malcolm. That's fascinating. Yeah. So, I mean, architectural styles don't necessarily change like that, like a light switch. So people, uh, folks would have maybe integrated a Federalist, Georgian, Dutch twist exactly. together. The way that the beams, the, the floor joists were cut was with a reciprocal saw. A reciprocal saw stopped being used around 1800. So all of those beams have a, evidence of vertical cuts this way. No curvature. The, the, uh, the circular saw was not introduced into this country until 1819. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that immediately pushes our building back to the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. Some of the other e evidence is that uh, the wide plank five-quarter boards that originally make up the flooring often covered over with, with oak during the more recent occupancy um, are indications of age. That, that convention of how you did your floor, and that was it. There was no subfloor. It was just a five-quarter big plop, tongue and groove pine plank that you see in elegant homes, you see them in, in uh, farmhouses, but that went on for 150 years. And you still see evidence of that floor? Oh yes, there's a lot of, there's some that are 16, 18 inches wide. What, uh, in your estimation, would you say, Frank, the house represented uh, 1780s, 1790s? Was this a, considered a grand build? Was this considered more of a farm house? How, how, would, you, how would you characterize the home as it was built in the late 18th century? It, it was put together with some care. The, the, the truss work in the roof is 
classic 18th century framework and that was well done. But um, it wasn't, there wasn't extraordinary care. For example, a, a more prepossessing house would have probably had Flemish bond or English cross bond, mm -hmm. which creates a very subtle pattern in, in terms of the size and, and placement of brick. This is just common brick coursing. When you when you ret you go into the opening, take the windows out, you're going to see a curious and very unusual but an original frame that is set back in. You remove that frame and it uncovers a scaggle tooth uh, breakdown of any finished masonry. So this was put together fairly quickly. Um, it probably they wanted it to be grand, but it was not carefully built if, as if it would have been a, a, a city important landmark. So out in the country type of thing, yeah. country home, it's farm. It's a rural, rural piece of architecture. And you think agriculture was the main use on the property? Yeah, I think so. But this was Dutch built. If it was Dutch built, then the barns would most definitely be Dutch built. And the Dutch built a unique kind of barn. It was almost like a basilica barn. It was called the Dutch barn. And um, they had outer frame. The pitch of the roof, again, will indicate the, the earliness of the barn. The steep um, Dutch barns were early 18th century. They, they flattened out as they got mm -hmm. uh, old, uh, younger. They had, they had an inner set of columns that went up to support the, the mid um, span of the uh, roof rafters. A cross beam, which is often this big, it was called a swingle beam. You've probably seen that, you know, in places like the Maybe Farm. They have a great big Dutch barn. But if that's what that barn is, then we might be able to revise the date earlier based on what we find with the barn. As far as materials that were used, um, A, how would they have gotten them out here? I and mean, this would have been kind of in the middle of the wilderness of some sort. And B, does that indicate um, the level of uh, quality of material that they could have had access to? And the brick making um, did occur in the U.S. pretty early. And the, clearly there's evidence of a lot of brick in the stockade. So there was a, a kiln and a, and a brick making place wherever there was clay, somewhere within a wagon distance. Um, so that's how they got the brick. And there's also some nogging in this uh, um, building. Nogging is, uh, is brick that is not fired, that would be put in between the, the, the timbers mm -hmm. as fireproofing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's both hard brick on the outside and some soft brick on the inside. So, so Frank, one of the things I wanted to talk about, uh, you've indicated that this this building really is, is probably was built in three different components, three yeah. different periods. Uh, maybe talk about each of the components here and uh, their time frame and what, what architectural style they were built in. The first piece was the central piece. And there would have been a chimney that would have occurred right there. There's full evidence in the basement of uh, the remains of a chimney that was actually broken through to create the cellar hole for this Victorian addition. Uh, so that at that point they, they did they they removed the chimney. There's evidence of a shaftway where the the brick uh, chimney would have gone right on up. There's also evidence which possibly we can photograph of the removal of the exterior wall. Um, it's a darker sort of um, zone um, on the exterior facade. So the first phase would have included the symmetrical windows and a symmetrical front door. Chimney here. Then this would have been built sometime during the 19th century. This probably was built I would say at the end of the 19th or early 20th century and what we'll end up doing is recreating this whole wing 
in a period vision of the salt box that respects the um, consistency of the architecture during that period. So someone could say that this, this centerpiece came first, some sort of blend of Georgian, Federalist, Dutch, uh, Dutch architecture. The later piece came uh, maybe about the Victorian era. Yep. And this last piece, salt box, um, potentially, I, I believe the records indicate a 1920s edition here. Okay, okay. Um, so that would be right in line. But uh, absolutely clear the evidence of that, that chimney that was there and what would have been the exterior wall. And you see that in the basement. Yes, yes. in fact, they, they, to get to, the easiest way to get to a, a future excavation of this wing was to blast right through the, the, uh, the actual fireplace. So you can see the original arched opening of the fireplace, and that is your passageway to the new foundation. They didn't respect the old very much in this, in this whole process of multiple renovations, which makes it a greater challenge to find the original fabric of this building and to uh, accurately date it. When, when we, you and I um, rethought the interior, we um, ha have really respected essentially the room configuration on the ground floor. We've um, created a new kitchen. We've created places where you can have conferences, uh, places where you can have uh, private parties, where you can have lectures and expositions. Um, so I think your vision, Chris, of this future museum is that it's really going to be an interactive history visitor center that allows a good bit of the population to enjoy it in multiple yes. ways. Yes. Absolutely. We really want to showcase it and we want it to be relevant uh, today as, as it was in the, in the past. It's really one of the few in the town of Glenville, uh, really the only historic home in public hands and an ability for us to really um, show it to and, and let our residents uh, enjoy it even today, 200 years later. I want to thank you, Frank, for uh, taking time to be here today and for all your work on this. Uh, well, it's an exciting project. It's going to be And great. we will continue to, to discover things yes. as we go through. Uh, it's important to be, be pretty confident of what we want to save and what we don't want to save, what, what we want to feature. And maybe, because there's some pretty exciting uh, mortise and tenon framing, maybe one of these ceilings is left for, for yeah. people to see how it was constructed. That'd be neat. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for watching uh, another edition of Glenville Talks. Uh, stay with us for the future editions of different aspects of Glenville's history uh, here on this YouTube channel. And so thank you for your uh, uh, spending time with us here today, and um, we'll be seeing you shortly.